Hi, everyone. Good morning. Today, we're joined by Dr. Brandon Webb, an infectious disease physician here at Intermountain Healthcare to give our weekly COVID-19 update for the community. Brandon, thanks so much for joining us. It's nice to see you. You too, Amanda. So as always, I'm going to start with case trends and kind of talk about what's been happening since the last time we spoke. These numbers are reported from yesterday, just so everyone is aware. Our daily case count reported yesterday was 1,491, which is up 211 from this time last week. Uh, the state is now reporting school age cases as well, and they reported yesterday 358 cases. We've had 10 deaths yesterday, and our hospitalizations are at 463, which is up from 399 reported last Friday. Our seven-day positive rate as well is 15.4%, which is up from 13.9% last Friday. Dr. Webb, let's talk about that a little bit. I'd love to first talk about capacity and what our hospitals are currently seeing. Um, and, and can you just say also which hospital you specifically work at as well? Yeah, I work at uh, both Intermountain Medical Center and LDS Hospital and have telemedicine privileges at a number of the other hospitals throughout the state. So um, have a pretty good eye on what's going on throughout the state. And can you talk to us uh, about what our capacity seems to be in our ICUs and the demographics that we're seeing there as well? Absolutely. Yeah, capacity is a, a concept that's a little bit tricky to understand. I've had good questions from community members about um, what our capacity is. And I think a lot of people ask, you know, aren't you always full? And there's full and then there's beyond full. And let me actually just speak to that for a minute. Um, in the ICUs, full uh, generally means that we have 80% of our beds that are um, currently in use. And the reason that's considered full is that when people have emergencies and must go to the ICU, we can't wait. And so there has to be beds at all times so that when patients do have emergencies, we have a bed available for them in an ICU. So when we get above 80%, we are above full, we're beyond full. And so uh, what, what um, we're experiencing right now, our capacities um, are in excess of 80%. Our volumes are actually beyond 100% across the Intermountain system. And because we load level, I'm not gonna speak about the volumes at any particular facility because we actually transfer patients between facilities to keep the load level across uh, hospitals. Uh, but we are above 100%. And what that means is that in many cases, we, we are lacking those emergency beds. And so we're unable to uh, provide that immediate care in the same way that we, we normally need to. The next question is, well, why don't you just open up additional units? Um, and that is something that we've done during the winter phase of, you know, during the, the winter months last year. The difference this year is that we are uh, severely understaffed. Um, our nursing in particular, but also other uh, healthcare workers, including respiratory therapists and others um, have been really really severely impacted by the toll that caring for COVID and other patients has taken over the last 18 months. And we've lost a lot who have actually retired from healthcare. And we're having a really hard time refilling those positions. And that's, that's the reality. We, we might have physical space, but we don't have personnel like we did last winter. So that, that's kind of the reality of our capacity right now. And the, the nursing shortage too, I think it's important to note, this isn't just a Utah thing, this is happening nationally. Uh, and there's probably reasons for it. Burnout, people are have been doing this for a year and a half. But you mentioned this load leveling piece and how we kind of transfer between hospital and hospital. Uh, can you kind of speak a little bit more to why that's so important too and, and why we can't speak to where one hospital specifically at because of the system? It's actually a, a tremendous benefit to Utahns that we have coordination both within the Intermountain system, but also between Intermountain and the other healthcare systems. Um, the Utah Hospital Association and um, the chief medical officers of the major healthcare systems 
are in close communication constantly so that we can coordinate care uh, to, to do our very best to make sure that access is equitable throughout the state by doing just that, by, by um, providing the same standard of care and also by uh, transferring patients in a strategic way when we need to, to be able to keep those emergency beds open for emergencies. And also with, with COVID related ICU cases rising statewide, we, we're seeing the increase right now from last week. Can you talk about what the difference is between the non COVID related cases in the ICU and just the people who are there for emergencies? Uh, like what's the difference between the two? Absolutely. Um, we, we have a, we still have a very uh, diverse mix of patients in our ICUs and in our hospitals, which is a difference from last year because uh, we're still having traumas and accidents in the community. People are out um, doing things, they're on the roads far more than they were uh, last year. And so our, unfortunately our uh, non-COVID ICU care for a broad variety of medical conditions is still at high volume. And then on top of that, our COVID numbers have increased. And so we actually have this mixed demand on our ICUs that is creating the, you know, a, a significant burden. And I know that the time from, I think it's Memorial Day to Labor Day weekend is known as the 100 deadliest days of summer too. So it's not like we're really out of this trauma season that's typical for Utah. So I think that's why it's so important that yes, maybe the hospital is not full of 100% COVID patients, but other things happen. Uh, we don't just live in a world where COVID exists. So I think that's a really important distinct, a distinction that you just mentioned there as well. It's also our goal. You know, our our goal is to be able to provide access to top quality health care throughout the state, no matter what condition requires the care. And, and it's because that is our goal that um, the excessive COVID um, numbers uh, really impact our ability to provide that. I want to talk a little bit more about demographics of those that are in our hospitals right now too. I keep hearing reports that that number and age seems to be going down. Um, can you kind of speak to a general overview of who we're seeing in our hospitals right now and if those people have comorbidities versus they're healthy otherwise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we're seeing a couple of trends. Uh, the first is that um, our colleagues at Primary Children's Hospital are seeing uh, far more admissions for COVID during this phase, during the Delta phase, than we previous, previously saw uh, during other phases of the pandemic. And that's concerning. Um, we're also noticing that there is a trend in the admissions uh, for COVID patients on the adult side as well. Uh, there has been a decrease in the average age and the, the um, patients who tend to be admitted um, are, uh, although younger, uh, do have some health, health conditions like obesity, high blood pressure, and other conditions like that. Um, we are seeing some cases that are surprising, uh, people who appear otherwise healthy and um, get severe COVID. That's not the most common scenario, but it is happening. And when it is, um, it's another reminder that Delta is different. Uh, Delta is simply a different um, disease in some ways than, than the previous variants. And you talked about obesity. A lot of people ask us, well, what can I do to keep myself healthy and prevent myself from potentially having this severe reaction to COVID? Is there anything you can do to keep yourself uh, at less of a risk of ending up in the hospital? That's a great question. In the short term, um, being vaccinated, and taking precautions is the, the single most important thing that people can do who are generally healthy, but are uh, perhaps overweight or have some high blood pressure. What COVID has done is it shifted our, our way of thinking about um, the risk that some of those very common healthcare conditions um, uh, basically um, gives patients who are, um, able to you know generally be healthy but 
in the setting of COVID might have significantly higher risk because of obesity or high blood pressure or uh, type two diabetes and other conditions like that. Someone just asked a question. Um, are, can you describe the how the overcrowding has impacted the care of a specific patient? Patient, obviously, don't get into super specifics. Um, just generally, for instance, someone who maybe needed an ICU bed and wasn't able to. Is there a wait time? How are we dealing right now with with that specific piece? Yeah, having to be very creative, um, needing to to uh, make that load leveling step very fluid. Um, I, I can't give a specific patient example, but I will um, allude to a couple of things. So for example, some high risk surgeries very commonly require ICU admission after surgery. Not always, but because it is um, a complication or a, a part of the recovery process. We've had to take a very close look at those surgeries and decide whether we can provide those surgeries when we can't guarantee that there will be an ICU bed available post-operatively if the patient needs one. So that's just one example of, of how the high, value, uh, high volumes are impacting how we're able to provide the same care that we would like to provide if COVID numbers weren't so high. You spoke a little bit too around uh, primary children's and that going up, and I know you're not a pediatric infectious disease doctor, uh, but can you speak a little bit to why or speculate, I guess, on why we think that children are being more affected with the Delta variant? Is there any data that kind of tells us what's happening with this specific strain? Uh, it's, it's evolving right now. We don't have answers um, fully to that question. Um, as best we understand, it appears that um, because the Delta variant causes such high viral numbers, and we know that um, the more virus you're exposed to, the higher the likelihood that that virus is able to overwhelm the first lines of defense with the immune system and likely causes or could cause more severe disease. We think that that might be one of the reasons why we're seeing um, more severe disease in younger patients with Delta is that they're being exposed to higher amounts of virus when they come in contact with people who have the, the Delta variant. And um, that highlights one of the important points here, which is those uh, mitigation measures, uh, including masking and distancing and avoiding gatherings, they decrease the number of viral particles to which one is exposed if they have an exposure. And we hope that um, by taking those precautions, um, individuals can actually uh, prevent those more severe cases that we're seeing, especially in the younger populations. I want to switch talking specifically a little bit more about the vaccine. It was given FDA approval, Pfizer was, on, on Monday for those 16 plus, uh, but right now there is that emergency use authorization for 12 to 15. Can you talk about why that 12 to 15 group is not included in this FDA approval yet? Yeah, the, the FDA approval process is, is very detailed. Um, it's comprehensive and it takes uh, time to go through all of the steps and verifications that lead to the FDA having um, an opportunity to review all of the data that they need to give that full approval. And because the first clinical trials were in ages 16 and up, the, the process was initiated first with that group of patients. The process is underway with patients 12 and up and younger, but it's, it's slower. It's, it's uh, later in the FDA's process. So we do expect that um, the FDA will make full approval decisions on other age groups, but the first age group that they had the opportunity to, to make that approval on was the first for which clinical trials were completed. What about Moderna and Johnson & Johnson? Is there any news about when those two for the US could be FDA approved? Yeah, we understand that they are um, in the advanced stages of the FDA approval process as well. Um, the, the FDA is, again, in a very comprehensive and in-depth way, 
assessing all of the evidence that's accumulated to date. And uh, when that process is completed, um, we do expect that um, the FDA will make approval decisions for both of those vaccines as well. And I would expect that that's likely to come sometime in September. Parents also keep asking around when their children under the age of 12 can get vaccinated. And I know that there's not a specific magic eight ball that tells us a date when this is going to happen, but do we know anything more? Is there any more indications that you guys are hearing around when this could potentially be? Yeah, we're looking forward to that as well. Um, the FDA is, is also um, currently evaluating the risks and benefits and effectiveness and safety profile of vaccines in that younger population, in the um, population under 12 years old. And uh, we expect as well that, that um, those decisions may be uh, made sometime in late September. A question for you too around natural immunity of getting COVID and the vaccine. We've talked about this a lot, but it's still a question we're getting all the time. Can you explain why it's so important to still get the vaccine even if you've had COVID in the past? You bet. Um, natural immunity is a good thing. It's just not a good strategy. And the reason for that is that um, natural immunity varies tremendously from person to person, depending on age or health conditions, the health of one's immune system. It also varies tremendously in how long it lasts, depending on those similar conditions. So someone who has natural immunity from a year ago or more um, likely has waning immunity. We know that the immunity to coronaviruses in general lasts about one cold and flu season. The other issue is that the natural immunity that you get to one variant doesn't necessarily translate to other variants. And that we know uh, very clearly from our experience watching the second phase of COVID in other countries where they had very, very high rates of community exposure, sometimes as high as 85% of people in communities in India, South Africa, and Brazil had natural immunity to one strain. And then when the beta, gamma, and delta variants emerged into those populations, they had these devastating second phases despite having significant numbers of natural immunity. And what that highlights is that natural immunity really only um, reliably protects against that strain to which one was uh, infected earlier, but doesn't necessarily cross over. So, um, the, you know, the bottom line for natural immunity is that it does offer some protection. It's not a bad thing by any chance, uh, any, any uh, stretch, but for public health policy, it's very difficult to apply that because it varies so widely. On the flip side, if you do have natural immunity and you're vaccinated, you actually are, um, you stand to benefit more than those who uh, didn't have that natural immunity before. And the data here is evolving, but the benefits of being vaccinated after having had COVID include stronger immunity, longer lasting immunity, and broader immunity against a variety of variants. And we're, um, we, I think that that can't be overemphasized, that those benefits that people need to take into consideration when they're thinking risk versus benefit, should I get vaccinated? Those benefits uh, for individuals who've had COVID in the past are tremendous. And um, I think uh, need to be taken into account when making those decisions. A lot of people have also asked if there's a way for them to tell where their antibody levels are at, um, mm -hmm. especially with this talk of the third dose. Is there any way for someone to go to the doctor and get a test to say, okay, I don't actually need that booster. My immune system is still high enough levels, but I'll be okay. Yes and no. Um, it's, it's a tricky thing. Uh, and the reason for that is that there are a number of tests that measure antibodies, but they're as yet not a, there's no standardized level of antibody level. And because of that, um, we don't have a standardized interpretation of what the numbers mean on those antibody tests with respect to how protected someone is. 
So we can do a test and we can say, yes, you do have antibodies or no, you don't. But if we find that there are antibodies, one, we don't know if those antibodies have that cross covering protection against the Delta variant and others. And two, we don't um, have a good way of interpreting how high those antibody levels are until um, a further research establishes a good standard. So for right now, it's simply not recommended to use antibody testing to inform whether or not to get a booster. The benefits of the booster um, hold even if one has detectable antibodies. I'm assuming having more antibodies doesn't, there's no negative effect to that. It, there's only a positive piece to this, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are some there are some situations where checking those antibodies are useful uh, clinically, um, but from a public policy and in terms of um, whether or not somebody should get the booster, uh, they, they really right now don't have a role in that decision process. We've gotten a couple questions too around how you know as a, as a person who has COVID if you have the Delta variant or not. Is there a test that tells you this? And we've talked about this before, but we kind of explained how that process works from the state level. Yeah, um, because testing for variants uh, requires doing genetic sequencing and identifying those mutations that are unique to the variants. It's not something that uh, can be done quickly or is done in uh, clinical laboratories routinely. It's something that's done at the public health level in the state laboratory and other specialized laboratories and is not um, communicated clinically. So we don't have a, a good way uh, to get those data quickly or to communicate them in a, a way that um, you know is understandable at the patient level. But at the population level, right now we know that the Delta variant in many communities in the United States accounts for more than 93 to 95% of all variants. And uh, with it being so dominant, it's very, very likely that right now, if you get COVID, it's the Delta variant. I think that's a good reminder too around statistics and just that they're able, you doctors are able to pull uh, the, the some tests, figure out their Delta and then kind of have a wide variety of what's going on. So I think that's important. And to the public, it really shouldn't matter which variant you have, correct? The, the steps are still the same. Um, do treatments vary at all depending on the variant you have or is it all pretty much the same process? Yeah, care doesn't differ at all <clears throat> depending on the type of variant. Um, we've made intentional decisions about treatments um, like monoclonal antibody treatments, for example, to make sure that the, the products that we are using are active against all of the variants that may be circulating in the community. So uh, from a treatment standpoint, it, it really doesn't make a difference which variant one may be infected with. We've got a few more questions around surgeries as well as this concept of load leveling. Um, are there any surgeries right now that Intermountain is specifically delaying due to care and COVID? Um, and then also how far could someone go to have to get to a different hospital if there's not a bed available? Well, fortunately right now, um, we aren't in a position where we're having to triage patients um, or send them um, on, in, on their own transportation to find a bed for themselves. The load leveling that we talked about is a process that occurs internally, uh, is coordinated centrally by a, a transfer center, and um, is, is actually a, a pretty smooth process. We're not um, and, and don't expect to be in a position where we turn people away. So if you, if you need care, uh, we still recommend that you go to the nearest hospital and uh, we have full expectation that we'll be able to provide good care there. And just like we always do, if patients need care that exceeds the capacity of that particular facility, uh, we have fluid and streamlined ways of transferring patients. I want to talk a little bit about breakthrough cases. It's something we've covered a little bit here before with vaccinations. Um, 
it is increasing a little bit, but I don't know if statistically it's increasing or if we're just hearing about them more, but can you talk mm -hmm. about why we are potentially seeing more people get COVID who are vaccinated and also what the results, the end results of that are as well? Yeah. Uh, the number of breakthrough infections correlates very, very closely with the number of individuals in the community who are fully vaccinated. So over time, as we increase the number of fully vaccinated individuals, we expect to see a matching increase in the number of breakthrough infections. And those two trends uh, correlate very closely because simply put, the, the vaccines are still very effective, but not perfect. And the more individuals in the community who are vaccinated and with this high community transmission of COVID, we are going to see breakthrough infections. <clears throat> but overall, among the denominator of all individuals who are vaccinated, the protective benefits of vaccine are still uh, very, very good. Um, we're, we're still seeing excellent protection. Um, and in the individuals who do have breakthrough, despite being fully vaccinated, we now um, are uh, increasingly recognizing the benefits of vaccination. It appears that patients who are fully vaccinated and do go on to have a breakthrough infection have fewer symptoms, they have less severe symptoms, and they are far less likely to be hospitalized, require mechanical ventilation, or die from COVID. So uh, while, while the uh, breakthrough infection rates can be a little disappointing, um, I think we can still remain very encouraged that there are benefits to vaccination, both protective and also on the uh, side of protecting against severe infection and outcomes. Do you feel like if, or I guess, what should people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated continue to do to lower their personal risk of, of getting COVID? What are some things that people can keep doing in order to hopefully not get COVID? I think being aware that the vaccine itself does not create a force field around you. So what the vaccine does is actually enhances your immunity so that when you are exposed to the virus and the virus does start to do um, the, the processes that make the virus the virus, um, invading our cells and trying to replicate, the immune system in someone who's been vaccinated more quickly and more uh, forcefully responds to that. And uh, I think that understanding that's important. Um, that doesn't create a barrier to um, being exposed to the virus itself. It simply means that when you're exposed, your body is better equipped to deal with it. We need to, to layer the benefits of vaccination with those things that actually do create a barrier to being exposed to the virus itself. And at the community level, it's still, um, it's still very effective that individuals avoid gatherings, that they avoid uh, gatherings indoors especially, that when indoors and social distancing isn't possible, that they uh, choose to wear masks, and that individuals who are at higher risk of either breakthrough of fully vaccinated or of getting COVID if not vaccinated, know their risk and take appropriate precautions that, are, uh, that match the level of risk. A lot of schools have gone back in person and you kind of just alluded to this. Um, I actually went back to class last night for the first time in a very long time. And it was interesting to see the mask usage versus not mask usage. Uh, do you have any messages for those parents who are sending their children back to school or even college age kids who are going back to school who are vaccinated or not vaccinated and think that they're, because it's not required, I don't have to wear a mask. What are your thoughts on that? Well, mask wearing um, is a concept that um, is best understood at the group level. So if you have any given group, wearing masks is most effective when the majority of the group or all of the group are wearing the masks because there's some benefit to those wearing the masks. There's also um, a, an even stronger effect on 
preventing the number of viral particles shed. And that's especially important with Delta. And so I think just recognizing that while uh, mask wearing is, is certainly important, um, wearing masks as a group is the most effective way of mask wearing. And um, you know, we're, we are uh, encouraged when we hear that policies are made by different groups or institutions of higher learning um, to encourage mask wearing in groups because that's really where the majority of the benefit lies. Is there anything else you'd like to say today before we take off so I don't keep you for, for an hour? <laughs> no, you know, um, first of all, if, if you know a nurse or another healthcare professional, uh, go give them a hug, maybe a socially distanced hug, a uh, virtual hug. Um, you know, our, we, we really, um, are sympathetic to uh, caregivers across the board who are experiencing a lot of fatigue and burnout. Um, so let's, I think that a lot of our healthcare professionals are tired of being heroes. They're just tired. Um, so if you, if you know healthcare professionals, let them know that you appreciate them. Um, that matters. Uh, it's very meaningful to us. Second, you know, we've had a lot of, I think, what could be described as bad news lately. You know, I think that the perception is that vaccines don't work and that because we're seeing breakthroughs that, um, that the vaccine strategy was faulty in some way. And, and I would just counter that with um, th that's to be expected. The vaccines are still very effective and, and strongly encourage individuals who haven't been vaccinated to consider their own risk and benefit carefully uh, to get the right information and to get that information from credible sources and uh, to make those decisions based on their individual risk and benefit. And I think if people understand what the risks are, and we, we now know that the risks uh, in terms of adverse events to the vaccines are very, very low. Um, and the benefits are important, not just to individuals who are vaccinated, but they're very important at the community level. Vaccination coupled with non-pharmaceutical prevention measures like avoiding gatherings, limiting indoor gatherings, wearing masks appropriately, and social distancing whenever possible. Those two layers coupled together um, have the power to stop COVID. Uh, it's just a matter of, can we do it effectively enough to drive the numbers in our community down to where they were early in the spring and summer? Last question for you really quick before we take off. And this is a really good question. You mentioned credible sources of, of where people kind of wanna learn information. Uh, what are some good uh, sites that people can go to, just name a couple maybe, that have really great information um, that people can get around COVID? Well, our very own uh, state of Utah coronavirus.gov website has some, some very valuable information that's specific to Utahns. And I would point people towards that coronavirus.gov website first because it has links to other resources as well including the CDC, the FDA, and other resources. But it also has local data. And it, like I mentioned before, it's so important for individuals to understand their true risk and the benefits uh, to society. And I, I think that that's a great place to start. I would start with that local resource. And then vaccine.gov is another excellent web resource. And then finally, your local healthcare professional, you know, your primary care provider or specialty care provider, with whom you have an existing relationship is a, is a great place to start. Well, Dr. Webb, thank you so much for joining us and taking time to talk with us this morning. And if anyone like Dr. Webb mentioned wants information around COVID-19, they can go to coronavirus.utah.gov. We can also go to intermountainhealthcare.org backslash COVID vaccine. There are news articles uh, up on that website from our infectious disease physicians, as well as links to where you can get the vaccine if you're not already vaccinated. 
again, Dr. Webb, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you later. My pleasure. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks.